And to end our month of spooky mad lads, we get to the spookiest mad lad of all. A man who was considered to have actual magic powers that he used for dark and mysterious deeds, and who very often rubbed shoulders with members of high society who were looking to make use of his talents. He considered himself to be a prophet that would guide humanity into a new age, a new form of being. And he would do this by using ancient sex magic. Now, was this possible? Or was he just a bit of a nutter? Alistair Crowley. a like and a comment on this video because it really helps me in the algorithm. <coughs> but before we get into the mad lad, we have a new sponsor. This video was brought to you by Atlas VPN. I enjoy using Atlas VPN because it is seamless, fast and easy to use. No one should have to deal with corporations, governments or hackers spying and stealing their data. And Atlas VPN gives you a way to avoid all of that. And I use Atlas VPN to watch the American Netflix because annoyingly it is a lot better than the British Netflix. And also you would want to uh, turn on your VPN to read some of the literature that today's mad lad wrote. You can stop ads and malware because the VPN blocks all connections to malicious links, ads and trackers and it notifies you whenever someone is trying to steal your data. You can also save some money while shopping online and get the best deals while getting the most out of your online subscriptions such as Netflix, Spotify, airlines, hotels and more. Right now Atlas VPN is running a massive discount and you can get a 3 year subscription for just $1.39 a month with a 30 day money back guarantee. And the time is running out on this deal so get your deal quick by clicking my link in the description down below. New sponsor, show them some love. Click the link. Edward Alexander Crowley was born into a wealthy family on the 12th of October 1875 in Royal Leamington Spa in Warwickshire, England. His father, who was also named Edward Crowley, was a trained engineer, but his share in a lucrative family brewing business named Crowley's Alton Ales had allowed him to retire before his son was born. His mother, Emily Bertha Bishop, came from a Devonshire Somerset family and she had a strained relationship with her son from an early age and throughout his childhood she began to refer to him as the Beast, which is a name that Crowley later took great pride in. Crowley's parents married at London's Kensington Registry Office in November of 1874 and they were hardcore evangelical Christians. Crowley's father had been born a Quaker, but he had converted to the Exclusive Brethren, a faction of a Christian fundamentalist group known as the Plymouth Brethren, with Emily joining the group later on herself after they married. Crowley's father was extremely devout, spending most of his time as a travelling preacher for the sect and reading a chapter from the Bible to his wife and son after breakfast every single day. Crowley's parents gave birth to his sister, but she died in infancy in 1880. Shortly after this, the Crowleys moved to Red Hill in Surrey, and a few years later, at the age of eight, Crowley was sent to H.T. Habersham's Evangelical Christian Boarding School in Hastings, and then to Ebor Preparatory School in Cambridge, which was run by a reverend named Henry D'Arcy Champney, who Crowley considered later in his life to be a sadist because of the harsh punishments that he would hand out. In March of 1887, when Crowley was only 11 years old, 
His father died of tongue cancer and Crowley described the event as a major turning point in his life and said that he had always had a strong admiration for his father and that he was his hero. His father was probably the only person that could keep Crowley in check, however, because after his death, Crowley began to misbehave at school, likely due to not having any discipline at home. Crowley was harshly punished by Reverend Champney and Crowley's family later removed him from the school when he developed albuminuria caused by having protein in his blood that, that damaged his kidneys. Despite everything negative that was happening in his young life, Crowley found out that he had inherited a third of his father's massive wealth. Soon after this, Crowley attended Malvern College and Tonbridge School, both of which he absolutely despised and left after only a few terms. He became increasingly sceptical regarding Christianity, donning his fedora hat and pointing out inconsistencies in the Bible to his religious teachers. And he also started going against any form of Christian morality that his upbringing had taught him by smoking, uh, bashing the bishop, for lack of a better term, and having many liaisons with prostitutes, which, unsurprisingly, gave him gonorrhea after shagging around so much. You know, catching STDs to own the Christians. His sudden, eccentric, sinful behaviour didn't go unnoticed, but people would keep their mouths shut because Crowley had what we like to call fuck you money which offered him a lot of influence. Crowley was sent to live with a brethren tutor in Eastburn, where he undertook chemistry courses at Eastburn College. Crowley developed an interest in chess, poetry, and mountain climbing. Some of these hobbies, I imagine, gave people at least some hope for Crowley, because these were normal hobbies to have. In 1894, he climbed Beachy Head before visiting the Alps and joining the Scottish Mountaineering Club. And in the following year, he returned to the Bernese Alps, climbing the Eger, the Trift, the Jungfrau, the Munch, and the Wetterhorn. Now, I know that you all know Crowley for his magic, but one of the things that he spent the majority of his time doing was climbing mountains. The man loved mountain climbing, so there is... There is a lot of mountain climbing in this video. Afterwards, he changed his name from Edward to Alistair. And in October of 1895, he began a three-year course at Trinity College in Cambridge, where he was entered into the Moral Science Tripos to study philosophy. But with approval from his tutor, he changed to English literature. Crowley spent much of his time at university engaging in his normal hobbies, eventually becoming president of the chess club and practicing the game for two hours every single day. He even briefly considered a career as a professional chess player, although Crowley had also embraced his love of literature and poetry, with many of his own poems appearing in student publications such as The Granta, Cambridge Magazine and the Cantab. Outside of this, he continued his mountaineering, going on holiday to the Alps to climb mountains every year from 1894 to 1898, usually with his friend Oscar Eckenstein. And in 1897, Crowley made the first ascent of the Munch without a guide, and these feats led to Crowley's recognition in the Alpine mountaineering community. But chess and climbing mountains isn't exactly what Crowley was famous for. He was famous for his magic. And now we can finally get into how Crowley first became involved in mysticism. Crowley had his first significant mystical experience while on holiday in Stockholm, Sweden in December of 1896 and several biographers believe that this was the result of Crowley's first gay experience. Though in Cambridge, Crowley still had a lot of casual sex with women, mostly with female prostitutes, and due to this he eventually added syphilis to his collection of STDs. 
However, Crowley started taking part in same-sex activities a lot more regularly, despite it being illegal to be gay at the time. This is likely what pushed his focus towards magic that was based around sex, and led to him starting to dip his toes into the occult. Later in October of 1897, Crowley met Herbert Charles Pollitt, who was the president of the Cambridge University Footlights Dramatic Club, and Pollitt was also an on-stage female impersonator of a character called Diane de Rouge, basically what we would call nowadays a drag queen. Shortly after they had met, the two entered into a short relationship that ended very quickly because Pollitt likely thought that Crowley was a bit of a creep with his increasing interest in the occult and Western esotericism, which is a widely used term in religion and philosophy, usually referring to possessing some kind of special or secret knowledge. This is the beginning of Crowley trying to involve his partners in magic ritual sex. Though this time he was turned down and he was still an amateur in the subject. Later in his life, however, Crowley regretted his relationship with Pollitt breaking down, saying that it was an imbecile mistake and he felt that he should have put more importance on their relationship and less on their cult. In 1897, Crowley travelled to St. Petersburg in Russia, claiming that he was trying to learn Russian, as he still had some normal ambitions at this point and was considering a future diplomatic career. But another turning point in his life happened. He was struck with a brief illness that made him begin to have something similar to an existential crisis. He started thinking in nihilistic ways towards the futility of all human endeavour, and Crowley abandoned all thoughts of a diplomatic career in favour of pursuing an interest in the occult. It's believed that during his illness, he had fever dreams which he misinterpreted as visions, solidifying his path into magic and killing his interest at any idea of a normal career or any idea of a normal life. In March of 1898, Crowley obtained Arthur Edward Waite's book, The Book of Black Magic and of Pacts, and then Carol von Eckershausen's The Cloud Upon the Sanctuary, which further fueled Crowley's interests in the occult. And later in the year, Crowley privately published a hundred copies of his own poem, Asil Dama, A Place to Bury Strangers In. It was not particularly a success, but afterwards he published a string of other poems, including a poem called White Stains, which was a series of poems that he had written about... Well, the title kind of gives it away, doesn't it? Though this string of poems had to be printed abroad because publication of such materials was illegal in Britain at the time. In July, Crowley left Cambridge not having taken any degree at all, despite being a first-class student. Instead, Crowley went to Zermatt in Switzerland where he met a chemist called Julian Baker and the two bonded over their common interest in alchemy, and when they both travelled back to London together, Baker introduced Crowley to George Cecil Jones, who was Baker's brother-in-law and a fellow member of an occult society known as the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, which was founded in 1888. Crowley was initiated into the Outer Order of the Golden Dawn on the 18th of November 1898 by the group's leader Samuel Liddell McGregor Mathers, with the Outer Order being the lowest rank in the group. Apparently, Mathers took a particular liking to Crowley very quickly. The initiation ceremony took place in the Golden Dawn's Isis Urania Temple, held at London's Mark Mason's Hall, where Crowley took the magical motto and the name Freter Perderabo, which he interpreted as 
I shall endure to the end. The Golden Dawn had some fairly notable members among the group, such as Bram Stoker, W.B. Yeats, and even Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Using the vast wealth that he still had from his father's inheritance, Crowley moved into his own luxury flat at Chancery Lane in London, and soon invited a senior Golden Dawn member named Alan Bennett to live with him as his personal magic tutor, since Crowley was still an amateur in magic. Bennett taught Crowley more about ceremonial magic and the ritual use of drugs, and together they performed the rituals of the Goetia, the purpose of this particular ritual was for establishing contact with what they called a personal holy guardian angel for protection, to protect them in future spells where they planned to summon and communicate with a demon. Later, Bennett left Crowley to study more on his own as he went to learn about Buddhism in South Asia. In November of 1899, Crowley purchased Bolskine House in Foyers on the shore of Loch Ness in Scotland. The house was apparently built on top of the ruins of a 10th century church that burned to the ground during a service, killing all of the congregants inside. While living in Scotland, Crowley developed a love of the culture, calling himself the Laird of Bolskine, and started wearing traditional Highland dress even during his visits down to London. And it is said that after Crowley learned how to perform his own rituals, he spent a lot of time performing these rituals in Bolskine House, trying to summon demons. One of these rituals was called the Abramelin, which was a black magic ritual that actually takes six months to complete. And it is a ritual that apparently involves demonic possession. And this ritual was so dangerous and its requirements so extreme that no other occultist would dare touch it. The ritual text even states that no one should ever perform it. But Alistair Crowley just saw this as a challenge and did the ritual anyway. What the outcome of this ritual was, we have absolutely no idea, but we do know that the reason Crowley did it was to gain more power. In the background of his weird rituals, Crowley continued writing, publishing Jephtha, one of his more popular poems, and other poems between 1898 and 1899. Most of them gained mixed reviews from critics, although Jephtha was considered a critical success, and when Crowley wasn't writing mediocre poetry, he would be practicing his magic rituals, one of which apparently involved him having some fun with himself on the shore of Loch Ness, and releasing in, into the water. He would, he would release himself into the loch. I've swam in that loch. Due to his obsession and growing knowledge of the occult, Crowley quickly progressed through the lower grades of the Golden Dawn and was ready to enter into the group's inner second order. However, Crowley was unpopular in the group because the others had learned of his eccentricity, bisexuality, and libertine lifestyle, which was seen as degenerate and gained him a bad reputation. He had even developed feuds with some of the other members, especially with Yates, who called Crowley indescribably mad. And apparently, Crowley and Yates even engaged in a magic battle. A magic battle. Yates wrote in his journal that Crowley had arrived at the Golden Dawn Temple, dressed in Highlander's tartan, while wearing an Osiris mask and a black crusader cross on his chest, while making the sign of an upside-down pentacle and shouting insults at the other adepts. 
Crowley was also brandishing two daggers and had started to climb the stairs towards the adepts. But Yates and two other magicians came forward down the stairs to meet Crowley in battle, ready to protect their holy place. So, what what spells were cast? What what magic was used in this Harry Potter duel? None. Absolutely none at all. All that happened was Yates approached Crowley and Sparta kicked him down the stairs. Later, when the Golden Dawn's London Lodge refused to initiate Crowley into the Second Order as an Adeptus Minor grade, due to Crowley's behaviour, Crowley visited the leader directly in Paris, who personally admitted Crowley into the highest rank of the Second Order, with the title of Adeptus Exemptus. And, because of this, a wedge had developed between Samuel Mathers and the rest of the Golden Dawn, who demanded the evidence and reasoning behind Crowley's promotion. Mathers declined to provide any explanation and dismissed them, which made the members of the group very unhappy with Mathers' autocratic rule. Acting under Mathers' orders, Crowley, with the help of his mistress and fellow initiate Elaine Simpson, made an attempt to seize the Vault of the Adepts, which sounds very impressive until you see what it actually looks like today. Basically, Crowley tried to take over one of the Order's properties, and the case was taken to court. And the court ruled in favour of the Order, since they were the ones who actually paid the rent and were the ones actually named on the lease, not Crowley. This escapade left both Crowley and Mathers isolated from the rest of the group. Meanwhile, a superstition grew among the locals in Scotland that Bolskeen House had become cursed, and some of them wouldn't even walk anywhere near the house. Allegedly, Crowley had not expelled any of the demons that he had summoned during his rituals in the house, and these demons were called the Twelve Kings and Dukes of Hell. And Crowley even bragged about summoning them to anyone that he could. Crowley's housekeeper and caretaker both had unfortunate events happen in their lives that Crowley was blamed for. His housekeeper lost both of her children very abruptly with no apparent cause, and the caretaker became a drunk despite being an extremely pious man. And then later, the caretaker attempted to murder his own entire family. In the 1900s, Crowley travelled to Mexico via the United States, settling in Mexico City and starting a brief relationship with a local woman. And after developing a love of the country, he continued experimenting with ceremonial magic, likely by taking advantage of the impoverished locals and involving them in his rituals. Crowley later claimed that he had been initiated into Freemasonry while he was there in Mexico. He then wrote a play based on Richard Wagner's Tannhauser, as well as a series of other poems published under the title of Oracles. His friend Eckenstein joined him later in the year, and together they climbed several mountains, and one of the mountains they climbed named Colima, they had to abandon the expedition halfway through due to a volcanic eruption. Crowley later left Mexico and headed to San Francisco before sailing for Hawaii aboard the Nippon Maru. On the ship, he had an affair with a married woman named Mary Alice Rogers, saying that he had fallen in love with her. Crowley then wrote a series of poems about the romance and published them with the title Alice and Adultery, basically exposing the entire affair to her husband. After briefly stopping in Japan and Hong Kong, 
Crowley reached Ceylon, now known today as Sri Lanka, where he met with Alan Bennett, who was there studying Shaivism. The pair spent some time in the city of Kandy together and likely shared their occult knowledge that they had learned since they last spoke, before Bennett once again departed, travelling to Burma to become a Buddhist monk. Crowley decided to tour India, devoting himself to the Hindu practice of Raja Yoga, from which he claimed to have achieved a spiritual state. He spent a lot of his time studying at one of the temples in Madura, where he contracted malaria, and he had to recuperate from the disease in Calcutta. And during this illness, he once again had fever dreams and once again interpreted them as visions. In 1902, Crowley was once again joined by Eckenstein and several other mountaineers from India, forming what was known as the Eckenstein Crowley Expedition. The goal of the expedition was to ascend K2, the second tallest mountain in the world, which had never been climbed before. On the journey, Crowley was afflicted with influenza, malaria, and snow blindness, and the other expedition members were also struck with a bunch of illnesses. So after reaching an altitude of 20,000 feet, they all decided to call it quits and had to turn back. After recovering, Crowley arrived in Paris in November, where he socialised with friends and his future brother-in-law, who was a painter named Gerald Kelly, and through him, Crowley became a fixture of the Parisian art scene. And while he was there, Crowley wrote a series of poems on the work of an acquaintance, the sculptor Auguste Rodin, and these poems were later published as Rodin in Rhyme. Crowley then returned to Bolskine House on the shores of Loch Ness in April of 1903, and shortly afterwards, Crowley married Gerald's sister, Rose Edith Kelly, in what he called a marriage of convenience. Her marrying Crowley would prevent her from entering into an arranged marriage, so this greatly upset the Kelly family and damaged his friendship with Gerald. Crowley, however, really didn't give a shit about any of that and he went ahead with his honeymoon. Starting in Paris, the couple travelled to Cairo and then to Sri Lanka and after spending some time together, Crowley had eventually actually fallen in love with Rose and attempted to prove to her that his love was genuine. While on his honeymoon, he wrote her a series of love poems and published them as Rosa Mundi and other love songs, as well as authoring a religious satire going along with his dislike of the church. And this satire was called Why Jesus Wept. In Cairo, in February of 1904, Crowley and Rose claimed to be a prince and princess and they rented an apartment where Crowley had set up a temple room and Crowley began invoking ancient Egyptian deities and studying Islamic mysticism and Arabic on the side. According to Crowley's later account, Rose regularly became delirious and kept saying to him, they are waiting for you. And on the 18th of March, Rose explained that they were the Egyptian gods, specifically the god Horus. And on the 20th of March, Rose, during one of her little delirious fits, proclaimed that the equinox of the gods has come. The merge. Rose led Crowley to a nearby museum, where she showed him a 7th century BCE mortuary stele, known as the Stele of Ankafin Konsu. And one thing about this particular exhibit really stood out to Crowley. Exhibits in this museum were numbered, and the number of this particular exhibit was 666. In later years, Crowley named this artefact the Stele of Revealing. According to Crowley's later statements, he had heard a disembodied voice that claimed to be that of Iwas, the messenger of Horus. 
Crowley said that he wrote down everything that the voice told him over the course of the next three days. And the title of this scripture was The Book of the Law. The book proclaimed that humanity was entering a new aeon and that, of course, Crowley would serve as its prophet. The book stated that a supreme moral law was to be introduced in this aeon, with Crowley's famous quote, Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law, meaning that people should basically do whatever the hell they wanted. This book and the philosophy that it espoused based on the mysterious voice that Crowley claims to have heard inspired Crowley to create a whole new religion. A religion that he named Thelema. Crowley said that at the time, he had been unsure of what to do with the Book of the Law. In fact, Crowley found himself actually resenting it and saying that he ignored the instructions in the text and the instructions that the mysterious voice commanded him to do, which included stealing the stele of revealing from the museum as well as fortifying his own island and translating the book into every language. According to Crowley's own account, he instead sent type scripts of the work to several occultists that he knew before putting the manuscript away and ignoring it. Returning again to Bolskine House, Crowley came to believe that his old friend Mathers had begun using black magic against him, and the relationship between the two men broke down. Though this may have just been a stunt by Crowley to make people believe in magic even further, or this was a result of the paranoia that Crowley was suffering from the sheer amount of drugs he was doing. Because uh, one thing that Crowley did uh, during his magic rituals was take a lot of drugs. On the 28th of July, 1905, Rose gave birth to Crowley's first child, a daughter that he named Lilith, because of course he named her Lilith. In order to entertain his wife while she was recovering from childbirth, Crowley started writing dirty pornographic poems for her, titling one of them, Snowdrops, referencing... You know, you know what it was referencing, you know, totally, totally normal behaviour. During this time, Crowley also founded a company to publish his poetry, naming it the Society for the Propagation of Religious Truth in parody of the Society for Promoting Christian Knowledge. Among its first publications were Crowley's collected works, edited by Ivor Black, an old friend of Crowley's who was both a practising surgeon and an enthusiast of literature. Crowley's poetry would very often receive strong reviews, both positive and negative, but never really sold well. And in an attempt to gain more publicity, Crowley issued a reward of £100 for the best essay on his work, which in today's money is around £12,400 or $17,200. The winner of this reward was J.F.C. Fuller, a British army officer and military historian, whose essay titled The Star in the West heralded Crowley's poetry as some of the greatest ever written. And of course, he absolutely meant that and it had nothing at all to do with, you know, the fat cash prize. Sometime later, Crowley decided to climb the third highest mountain in the world, Kanchenjunga in the Himalayas, which Crowley knew was widely recognised as the world's most treacherous mountain to climb. This was a collaboration with four other mountaineers, though the expedition was marred by a lot of arguing between Crowley and the others, who thought that Crowley was being very reckless. But Crowley wasn't being reckless, as he had magical protection. No, really, Crowley thought that he had magical protection. They eventually mutinied against Crowley's control, and the other climbers headed back down the mountain near nightfall, despite Crowley's warnings that it was too dangerous. 
And sadly, one of the mountaineers and several of the porters were killed in an accident. Something which Crowley was widely blamed for by the mountaineering community. And allegedly, Crowley had actually heard their screams for help, but just ignored them and chilled in his tent. Crowley then spent some time in eastern India, where he took part in big game hunting and wrote one of his rarest homoerotic books named The Scented Garden of Abdullah, which is a mixture of poems about Persian mysticism and the glorification of homosexual love. In the closing sections of the book, the name of the drag queen we spoke about earlier, Herbert Charles Jerome Pollitt, is spelled out in the first letter of each line, referencing one of Crowley's first ever homosexual relationships. The book is very, very rare today because most copies of it were destroyed by British customs on the grounds of extreme obscenity. Crowley met up with Rose and Lilith in Calcutta before being forced to leave India after shooting two men who tried to mug him though both of the men survived. Crowley and his family decided to leave on a tour of southern China, hiring porters and a nanny for the journey. Crowley had been smoking opium throughout the entire journey and spending much of his time on spiritual and magical work, reciting what he called the Bornless Ritual, an invocation to his holy guardian angel on a daily basis. The Bornless ritual involved summoning a guardian angel to protect you from any demons that may try and make contact with you. Rose and Lilith eventually returned home, leaving Crowley alone to travel. Crowley then went to New York City, stopping first in Japan and then Canada. And after arriving, he unsuccessfully solicited support for a second expedition to climb Kanchenjunga. And... After his return to Britain, Crowley learned that his daughter Lilith had sadly died of typhoid that she had contracted while she was in Rangoon. And Crowley blamed Rose for this because of her alcoholism. Under increasing emotional distress, Crowley's health began to suffer, which meant that he had to undergo a series of surgical operations. Even during this hard time in his life, he had begun two short-lived relationships with an actress named Vera Lola Neville and an author named Ada Leverson, all while Rose gave birth to Crowley's second daughter, Lola Zaza, in February of 1907. With his old mentor, George Cecil Jones, Crowley continued to perform rituals at the Ashdown Park Hotel in Coolsdon in Surrey. Crowley claimed that in doing so, he attained Samadhi, which is the highest state of consciousness that someone can achieve through meditation. One thing that probably helped with his meditation was hash, which Crowley made very heavy use of. Crowley even wrote an essay titled The Psychology of Hashish, in which he championed the drug as an aid to mysticism. In October and November of 1907, Crowley claimed that he was once again repeatedly visited by Iwas, the messenger of the god Horus, and Crowley said that Iwas dictated two further holy texts to him, both of which were later classified into the corpus of the holy books of Thelema. Crowley wrote down more Thelemic holy books during the last two months of that same year, which he once again claimed to have received from disembodied demonic voices. Crowley stated that in June of 1909, when the manuscript of the Book of the Law was rediscovered at Bolskeen House, that he developed the opinion that Thelema, his new religion that he had invented, bestowed upon him by voices that he heard during fever dreams and drug binges, represented objective truth. And so, he completely embraced it. However, Crowley's inheritance was starting to run out. So, in an attempt to earn some money, 
he looked for work. Something that he had never really had to do before since he was always wealthy. Crowley was eventually hired by George Montague Bennett, the Earl of Tankerville, so that Crowley could help protect him from witchcraft. During this time, Crowley recognised that Bennett's paranoia about witches was caused by his cocaine addiction. So, instead of taking advantage of him, Crowley instead took him on holiday to France and Morocco so he could go to rehab. Crowley needed a way to make money, but also a way to spread his new batshit religion. So, in 1907, Crowley began taking in paying students who he instructed in the art of the occult and magical practice. Victor Neuberg, who Crowley had met in February, became his closest disciple and sexual partner. Later, the pair toured northern Spain together before heading to Tangier in Morocco. The following year, Neuberg stayed at Bolskin House, where he and Crowley engaged in sadomasochism during magic rituals. And a lot of people in their circles believe that Neuberg didn't always consent. Crowley continued to write, producing more poetry, as well as his first attempt at an autobiography that he titled The World's Tragedy. Recognising the popularity of short horror stories, Crowley started writing his own, with several articles appearing in Vanity Fair. Not because they were just that good, but because Crowley had a friend working there at the time. In November, Crowley and Jones founded an occult order to act as a successor to the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, being aided in doing so by Fuller. The result was the AA, which is thought to stand for Argentium Astrum, which is Latin for Silver Star. And also because of that dumb moon runes name from now on, I'm just going to be calling it the Silver Star. The group's headquarters and temple were located at Victoria Street in central London, and most of their rites and ceremonies were ripped off from the Golden Dawn but with an added Thelemic spin to them. Some of the Silver Star's earliest members included mostly artists and authors, but it also had an engineer and a solicitor. And in March of 1909, Crowley began production of a biannual periodical titled The Equinox, and he billed this periodical, which was to become the official organ of the Silver Star, as... The Review of Scientific Illuminism. Around this time, Crowley had become increasingly frustrated with Rosie's alcoholism, and in November of 1909, he divorced her on the grounds of his own adultery. That is, that is quite the 4D chess move. Crow Crowley's daughter Lola was entrusted to Rosie's care and the couple remained friends with Rose continuing to live at Bolskine House. Though Rosie's alcoholism worsened and as a result of this she was institutionalised in September of 1911. Crowley and his disciple Neuberg travelled to Algeria with Crowley reciting the Quran on a daily basis, and during the trip, Crowley invoked the 30 Atheers of Enochian magic, with Neuberg recording the results, and these results were later published in The Equinox, and it was titled The Vision and the Voice. This was then followed by a mountaintop sex magic ritual. <laughs> a mountaintop sex magic ritual. Uh, Crowley then also performed an evocation to the demon Chironzon, involving a blood sacrifice. And Crowley considered the results of this ritual to be a watershed moment in his magical career. And apparently during this ritual, Crowley made Neuberg sodomise him. 
Returning to London in January of 1910, Crowley found out that Mathers was suing him for publishing Golden Dawn secrets in the Equinox, and the court ruled in favour of Crowley. The case was widely reported on in the press, gaining Crowley even wider fame, and he enjoyed the attention greatly. He played up to the sensationalist stereotype of him being a Satanist and being an advocate of human sacrifice, despite the fact that Crowley was neither of these things. The publicity attracted new members to the Silver Star, and meanwhile, an Australian violinist named Leela Waddle soon started a relationship with Crowley. Deciding to expand his teachings to a wider audience, Crowley developed the Rites of Artemis, a public performance of magic and symbolism featuring Silver Star members who would personify various deities. It was first performed at the Silver Star headquarters, with attendees being given a fruit punch containing peyote to enhance their experience. Various members of the press attended and reported pretty positively on it, which I'm sure had absolutely nothing to do with the peyote. In October and November of 1910, Crowley decided to stage something similar, the Rites of Eleusis at Caxton Hall in Westminster. And this time the press reviews were mixed and Crowley came under criticism from Westerwind Fenton, who was the editor of the Looking Glass newspaper, who called Crowley one of the most blasphemous and cold-blooded villains of modern times. Fenton's article suggested that Crowley and his mentor, George Cecil Jones, were involved in homosexual activity. Crowley didn't really care about this, of course, but Jones did try to sue Fenton for libel and was unsuccessful. Fuller, however, broke off his friendship and involvement with Crowley over the scandal. And shortly afterwards, Crowley and Neuberg returned to Algeria for further magical work and likely to get away from all the fuss in the press. In 1911, Crowley holidayed in France, where he wrote prolifically, producing poems, short stories, plays, as well as 19 works on magic and mysticism, including the two final holy books of Thelema. In Paris, he met Mary Deste, who became his next Scarlet Woman, in reference to the... Whore of Babylon from the Book of Revelation. But it is also a term used to refer to a woman who has a lot of casual sex. You know, a thought. And the two of them started undertaking magical works in St. Moritz. Crowley believed that one of the secret chiefs was speaking through Mary Deste when she was in a trance. The secret chiefs are said to be transcendent cosmic authorities, and this secret chief in particular was named Abildiz. <laughs> Abildiz nuts! Ha <laughs> ha! Crowley uh, wrote down everything that Deste was saying while in a trance and created a two-volume book, developing the spelling of magic with a CK at the end in order to separate his work from the stage magic of illusionists. In early 1912, Crowley published The Book of Lies, a work of mysticism that biographer Lauren Sutton described as his greatest success in merging his talents as poet, scholar and magus. The German occultist Theodor Rus, however, later accused Crowley of publishing some of the secrets of his own occult order, the Ordo Templi Orientis, within the book. Crowley convinced Rus that the similarities were merely coincidental and the two ended up becoming friends. Roos later appointed Crowley as head of the OTO's British branch, the Mysteria Mystica Maxima, and at a ceremony in Berlin, Crowley adopted the magical name of Baphomet, and was proclaimed 
10th degree Supreme Rex and Sovereign Grandmaster General of Ireland, Iona and all the Britons. Which is a little bit of a mouthful, but who doesn't want to be a Grandmaster T-Rex? Uh, but anyway, with uh, Rusi's permission, Crowley started advertising the Mysteria Mystica Maxima and rewriting many of the OTO rituals, which were then based largely on Freemasonry. And Crowley's incorporation of Thelemite elements into these rituals proved controversial within the group. But Crowley, of course, was fascinated by the OTO's emphasis on sex magic and devised a magical working based on anal sex and incorporated it into the syllabus for those OTO members who had been initiated into the 11th degree. So, you want to ascend to the 11th level? You know what you gotta do. In March of 1913, Crowley acted as producer for the Ragged Ragtime Girls, a group of female violinists led by Waddle as they performed at London's Old Tivoli Theatre. They subsequently performed in Moscow for six weeks, where Crowley had a sadomasochistic relationship with a Hungarian woman named Annie Ringler. Crowley continued to write plays and poetry, including Hymn to Pan and The Gnostic Mass, a Thelemic ritual that became a key part of OTO ceremonies. Tobias Churton, the writer of Crowley's biography, suggested that Crowley had travelled to Moscow on the orders of British intelligence to spy on revolutionary elements within the city. In January of 1914, Crowley and Neuberg settled into an apartment in Paris. Together, Crowley and Neuberg performed a six-week-long ritual called the Paris Working, a period of intense ritual involving very heavy drug use, in which they invoked the gods Mercury and Jupiter. And as part of the ritual, the couple performed acts of sex magic together, at times being joined by a journalist called Walter Durante. Inspired by the results of the working, Crowley wrote Liber Agape on the subject of sex magic, and following the Paris working, Neuberg began to distance himself from Crowley, because Crowley pretty much tortured him for the whole six weeks. This resulted in an argument with Crowley, so like any other sane person, Crowley put a curse on Neuberg, who suffered a nervous breakdown from the ordeal. By 1914, Crowley was living hand to mouth, relying largely on donations from Silver Star members and dues payments made to the OTO. In May, he transferred ownership of Bolskeen House to the Mysteria Mystica Maxima for financial reasons. And despite being poor, in July he still went mountaineering in the Swiss Alps. Because priorities. And during this time, the First World War had begun. After recuperating from another illness, Crowley set sail for the United States aboard the RMS Lusitania, in October of 1914. And don't worry, the, the ship safely made its voyage to New York, but the Lusitania wouldn't be around for much longer. Crowley moved into a hotel and began earning money writing for the American edition of Vanity Fair and undertaking freelance work for the famed astrologer Evangeline Adams. In the city, he continued experimenting with sex magic through the use of masturbation, female prostitutes and male clients of a Turkish bathhouse. And Crowley also started taking way, way more drugs than usual, which he would document in his diary. Professing to be of Irish ancestry and a supporter of Irish independence from Great Britain, Crowley began to espouse support for Germany 
and their war against Britain. He became involved in New York's pro-German movement and in January of 1915, German spy George Sylvester Virek employed Crowley as a writer for his propagandist paper, The Fatherland, which was dedicated to keeping the US neutral in the conflict. In later years, people would denounce Crowley as a traitor to Britain for this action, but in reality, however, Crowley was a double agent, working for the British intelligence services to infiltrate and undermine Germany's operations in New York. Many of Crowley's articles in the Fatherland were hyperbolic. In one article, he compared Wilhelm II to Jesus Christ. In July of 1915, Crowley orchestrated a publicity stunt which was reported on by the New York Times. Crowley declared independence for Ireland in front of the Statue of Liberty. The real intention of this was to make the German lobby appear ridiculous in the eyes of the American public, which is a strategy that's still very often used to this day. But anyway, it has been argued that Crowley also encouraged the German Navy to destroy the Lusitania, informing them that it would ensure that the US stayed out of the war, while in reality hoping that it would bring the US into the war on Britain's side. Which it did. But whether or not Crowley actually had a hand in the sinking of the Lusitania, that has never actually been confirmed. And personally, I don't actually think that's true. Crowley entered into a relationship with Jean Robert Foster, who he toured the West Coast with. In Vancouver, in the headquarters of the North American OTO, he met with Charles Stansfeld Jones and Wilfred Talbot Smith to discuss the propagation of Thelema on the continent. In Detroit, Crowley experimented with peyote at Park Davis and then visited Seattle, San Francisco, Santa Cruz, Los Angeles, San Diego, Tijuana and the Grand Canyon, you know, taking drugs and performing sex magic as he went before he returned to New York. And there he befriended Ananda Kumarasawami and his wife Alice Richardson. Crowley and Richardson performed sex magic in April of 1916, following which she became pregnant and then miscarried. Later that year, Crowley took a magical retirement to a cabin by Lake Piscaney. There he used drugs very heavily and undertook a ritual after which he proclaimed himself Master Therian, and Therian is a deity that Crowley created within his religion of Thelemism, and this deity is supposed to be an evolved form of the beast from the book of Revelation. Crowley also wrote several short stories based on J.G. Fraser's The Golden Bow and a work of literary criticism, The Gospel According to Bernard Shaw. In December, Crowley moved to New Orleans, which was his favourite US city, before spending February of 1917 with evangelical Christian relatives in Titusville, Florida, in what I imagine must have been an extremely awkward dinner. Uh, later, Crowley returned to New York City and moved in with artist and Silver Star member Leon Engers Kennedy after Crowley learned of his mother's death. After the collapse of the Fatherland, both the publication and the literal Fatherland, Crowley continued his association with VREC, who appointed him as contributing editor of arts journal The International. And Crowley used The International to promote Thelema, but it soon ceased publication. Crowley eventually moved into the studio apartment of Roddy Minor, who became his partner and new Scarlet Woman. Through their rituals, which Crowley called the Amalantra workings, he believed that they had summoned an entity. And Crowley had drawn a picture of this entity, which introduced itself as lamb. Mate, that's fucking mega mind. Shortly after the ritual, the relationship between Minor and Crowley 
broke down, which Crowley apparently thought was the result of some kind of supernatural curse. In 1918, Crowley went on a magical retreat in the wilderness of Esopus Island on the Hudson River for 40 days and nights. And here he began a translation of the Tao Te Ching and he painted Thelemic slogans on the riverside cliffs in red paint. Later, he claimed that he experienced past life memories of being Geshwan, uh, Pope Alexander VI, Alessandro Cagliostro, and Eliphas Levi. So, up until now, you've probably guessed that Crowley was just a little bit egotistical. Back in New York City, Crowley moved to Greenwich Village, where he took a woman called Leah Herzig as his lover and new Scarlet Woman. Crowley then took up painting as a hobby, exhibiting his work at the Greenwich Village Liberal Club and attracting the attention of the New York evening world. With the financial assistance of sympathetic Freemasons, Crowley revived the Equinox with the first issue of Volume 3, known as the Blue Equinox. He spent mid-1919 on a climbing holiday in Montauk before returning to London in December. However, all of the money had finally dried up and Crowley, now destitute, moved back to London where he came under attack from the tabloid John Bull, which labelled him as traitorous scum for his work with the German war effort. Several friends of his who were aware of his intelligence work advised him to sue, but Crowley decided not to, most likely because of how he felt about the benefits of bad press. Shortly after this, Crowley started to suffer from asthma and was prescribed heroin by the doctor, because back then, doctors could just prescribe you literal heroin. You could even just buy it over the counter. And unsurprisingly, Crowley became addicted. Because it's heroin. In January of 1920, Crowley moved to Paris, renting a house in Fontainebleau with Leah Herzig. And they were soon joined in threesomes with Nanette Shumway. Because of this, Crowley started to have ideas of forming a community of Thelemites, which he later called the Abbey of Thelema. And I think we all know enough about cults to see exactly where this is going. After thinking about it for a while, Crowley chose Cefalu in Sicily as the location for his community. And after arriving there, he began renting an old villa called Santa Barbara as his abbey. And he moved into the commune with Herzig, Shumway and their children, Hansi, Howard and Poopy. Motherfucker's name was Poopy. Crowley described this scenario as perfectly happy, my idea of heaven. They all wore robes and performed rituals to the sun god Ra at set times during the day, also occasionally performing the Gnostic Mass, which is a ceremony that calls for five officers, which are a priest, a priestess, a deacon, and two acolytes, which were also called children. I certainly hope that there was no sex magic involved in the Gnostic Mass, but there probably fucking was, wasn't there? Anyway, the rest of the day they were all left to follow their own interests, and undertaking widespread correspondences, Crowley continued to paint, and he wrote a commentary on the Book of the Law, and he also revised the third part of Book 4. Crowley offered a libertine education for the children, allowing them to play all day and also to witness certain magical acts. Hopefully not sex magic. It was probably sex magic. It was probably fucking sex magic, which we, which we all know today as a nonce behaviour. Anyway, he occasionally travelled to Palermo to visit rent boys and... <laughs> What the fuck is this man's life? Visit rent boys and buy supplies and drugs. 
I've, I've been filming for four hours, I don't care anymore. His heroin addiction was dominating his life, as you would expect, and all of the cocaine that he was snorting had begun to erode his nostrils. There was also no cleaning at all happening in the abbey, and wild dogs and cats would just run all over the place, shiting and pissing everywhere. But Crowley and the other Thelemites, of course, would continue having all of their orgies amongst all the piles of shit. In October of 1920, one of the children, Poopy, died because of the disgusting conditions. Poopy died because of disgusting conditions. I'm sorry, that's not funny. Uh, also, due to all of the sex that was happening, Nanette gave birth to a daughter shortly afterwards, and she was named Astarte Lulu Panthea. New followers continued to arrive at the Abbey to be taught by Crowley, and among them was a film star named Jane Wolfe, who arrived in July of 1920, where she was initiated into the Silver Star and became Crowley's secretary. Another was Cecil Frederick Russell, who often argued with Crowley because he didn't want to have forced sex with men, and he soon grew tired of that and left after a year. Frank Bennett, who was an Australian Thelemite, was cool with the same-sex rituals, and he spent several months at the Abbey. In February of 1922, Crowley returned to Paris for a retreat in an unsuccessful attempt to kick his heroin addiction. Since he was now poor, he went back to London in search of money, where he published articles in the English Review criticising the Dangerous Drugs Act of 1920, and he wrote a novel named Diary of a Drug Fiend, which was completed in July. And after it was published, the book received mixed reviews, and he was criticised by the Sunday Express, which called for its burning. And the Sunday Express used its influence to prevent further reprints. Shortly after this, Crowley returned to the Abbey. A young Thelemite named Raoul Loveday moved into the Abbey with his wife, Betty May, and Loveday was devoted and obsessed with Crowley. So his wife, May, was understandably jealous and detested Crowley and her life at the commune. She later said that Loveday was made to drink the blood of a sacrificed cat and that they were required to cut themselves with razors every time they used the pronoun I. Loveday later drank from a local polluted stream and soon developed a liver infection resulting in his death in February of 1923. Some people have said that around this time Crowley also had sex with a goat. <laughs> In, in what they called an ancient ritual that required human-animal intercourse. Herzig agreed to take part, but apparently the goat wasn't as willing. But, of course, this is only hearsay. After returning to London, Betty May told her story to the press, and the publication John Bull proclaimed Crowley as the wickedest man in the world. And a man we'd like to hang. And although Crowley deemed many of their accusations against him to be slanderous, he was unable to afford the legal fees to sue them. And as a result, John Bull continued to attack Crowley in their articles, with its stories being repeated in newspapers throughout Europe and North America. The fascist government of Benito Mussolini learned of Crowley's activities, you know, of carrying out homosexual sex magic rituals and fucking goats. <laughs> so, in April of 1923, Crowley was given a deportation notice, forcing him to leave Italy. So, since Crowley couldn't run the Abbey, since he wasn't even allowed in the country, the Abbey closed. Crowley and Herzig went to Tunis, where Crowley's health continued to decline. He tried again to give up heroin, 
but was unsuccessful. And he began writing what he called his auto-hagiography, meaning an autobiography, but written in a self-flattering and idealistic way. He called it The Confessions of Alistair Crowley. They were later joined in Tunis by a Thelemite named Norman Mudd, who became Crowley's public relations consultant, though I think it might have been a little bit too late for that. Crowley then employed a local boy, Mohammed Ben Brahim, as his servant, and Crowley went with him on a retreat to Nefta, where, as usual for Crowley, he and the boy did, did, did some magic spells together. In January of 1924, Crowley travelled to Nice in France, where he underwent a series of nasal operations due to the damage done to his nose by his cocaine habit. And since he had long since run out of his inheritance money, he was very, very poor by this point. He did, however, take on a wealthy student named Alexander Zuzalar before taking on another American follower, Dorothy Olsen. Crowley took Olsen back to Tunisia for what he called a magical retreat, and we, we all know what he means by that. And while he was there, he also wrote To Man, which was a declaration of his own status as a prophet entrusted with bringing Thelema to humanity. After spending the winter in Paris, in early 1925, Crowley and Olsen again returned to Tunis, where he wrote The Heart of the Master, which was an account of a vision that he experienced while in a trance, which I think is safe to say was drug-related. In March, Olsen became pregnant, and Hirzig was called to take care of her. Unfortunately, she miscarried, so Crowley took Olsen back to France. Hirzig later distanced herself from Crowley after the incident, and because of that, he denounced her. According to Crowley, Rus had named him the head of the Ordo Templi Orientis upon his death, though this was challenged by the leader of the German OTO, Heinrich Tranker. Tranker called a conference to dispute Crowley's claim in Thuringia in Germany, which Crowley attended. And while he was there, a few of the members backed Tranker by opposing Crowley's leadership, and this resulted in a split in the OTO. Moving back to Paris again, Crowley broke up with Olsen and then went back to sleeping with whoever he could for the following years. As usual, he experimented in sex magic with them and likely that alienated them because they tended not to stick around for too long. During this time, he was suffering from his worsening health, largely caused by his continuing heroin and cocaine addictions. In 1928, Crowley was introduced to a young Englishman named Israel Regardi, who embraced Thelema and became Crowley's secretary for the next three years. Crowley also met Gerald York, who began organising Crowley's finances, but he never became a Thelemite himself. He also befriended a gay journalist named Tom Dryberg, and Dryberg didn't accept Thelema either. So Crowley was struggling to gain a following like he had done so easily in his earlier years. So it was at this time that Crowley published one of his most significant and probably most famous works, and it was titled Magic in Theory and Practice. But this received very little attention when it was released. In December of 1928, Crowley met the Nicaraguan Maria Teresa Sanchez, but shortly after, Crowley was deported from France by the authorities because they disliked his reputation, and they also feared that he was a German agent due to his work in the past during World War I. So, to make sure that Maria could join him back in Britain, 
Crowley married her in August of 1929. A company called Mandrake Press agreed to publish Crowley's autobiography in a limited edition six volume set and also publishing his novel Moonchild and another book of short stories. But Crowley's luck appeared to be running out since Mandrake went into liquidation in November of 1930 before the entirety of Crowley's confessions could be published. Mandrake's owner, P.R. Stevenson, meanwhile, wrote The Legend of Alistair Crowley, which was an analysis of the media coverage surrounding him. Later in April, Crowley moved to Berlin, where he took Hanny Yeager as his magical partner. The relationship, however, was very troubled, so in September, Crowley went to Lisbon in Portugal to meet a poet named Fernando Pessoa, and Crowley decided to fake his own death. <laughs> and uh, doing so with uh, Pessoa's help at the Boca do Inferno rock formation. Apparently, this was so that he could leave his relationship with Jaeger and it would also serve as a publicity stunt. I mean, I guess, I guess that's one way to do a breakup. Crowley then returned to Berlin, where he reappeared three weeks later at the opening of his art exhibit at the Gallery Neumann Nierendorf. Just walking in like, how you doing everyone? I'm not actually dead by the way. I got you. I got you bro. You're like, <laughs> just walking in like fuck all happened. Um, Crowley's paintings did fit in with the fashion of German expressionism but only a few of them sold. <laughs> Sorry that. All of that and only a few of the paintings fucking sold. Um, and the press did report on him very favourably, you know, during all of this, despite the whole faking his own death bullshit. I've, I've been filming for so long right now, I am very, very tired. In August of 1931, Crowley started yet another relationship with a woman called Bertha Bush. And to sum up this relationship... It was extremely violent, and they attacked each other very regularly. Crowley continued to have affairs with both men and women while he lived in the city, and he met with more famous people like Aldous Huxley and psychologist Alfred Adler. In January of 1932, Crowley became friends with a communist named Gerald Hamilton and had him stay with him as a lodger. Hamilton introduced Crowley to many figures within the Berlin far left, though it is possible that he was once again operating as a spy for British intelligence at this time, monitoring the communist movement. Crowley eventually left the abusive relationship with Bush and returned to London, where he took Pearl Brooksmith as his new Scarlet Woman. Undergoing further nasal surgery, it was here in 1932 that he was invited to be guest of honour at Foyle's Literary Luncheon, and he was also invited to speak at the National Laboratory of Psychical Research. Still in dire need of money, Crowley launched a series of court cases against people that he believed had libelled him, and some of these cases proved to be successful and Crowley gained a lot of publicity for his lawsuit against Constable & Co for publishing Nina Hamnett's Laughing Torso, a book that Crowley claimed libelled him by referring to his occult practice as black magic. Which it wasn't. It was just regular magic. Also, this court case was unsuccessful for Crowley, and... All it really did was add further to his financial problems. And in February of 1935, Crowley was declared bankrupt. And during the hearing, it was revealed that Crowley had been spending three times more than what he was actually making for several years, completely draining his entire inheritance. Crowley developed a friendship with a woman named Deidre Patricia Doherty, and for some reason, 
she offered to have his child, who was later born in May of 1937. And though they named the child Randall Gale, Crowley nicknamed him Alistair Ataturk. Crowley continued to socialise with friends, holding curry parties. Now I know because it's Crowley, that sounds sinister and foreboding, but it, it literally was just a curry party. He and, his, he and his friends would just get together and make really spicy curry. In 1936, Crowley published his first book in six years, The Equinox of the Gods, which had many similarities to the Book of the Law and was considered to be part of the series. The work actually sold very well, resulting in a second print run. And a year later, he gave a series of public lectures on yoga in Soho. Crowley was now living largely off of contributions supplied by the OTO's Agape Lodge in California, which was led by rocket scientist John Whiteside Jack Parsons. Soon after this, Crowley witnessed the rise of Nazism in Germany, and Crowley, along with his friend Martha Kunzel, decided that they were going to try and convert Hitler to Thelemism. They, 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 looked, they looked at Adolf Hitler and thought to themselves, you know what, I think that we can get him interested in gay butt sex magic. However, this plan was scrapped after the Nazis abolished the German OTO and imprisoned its leader who would eventually flee to the US. And before this, however, Crowley actually admired Nazism and Marxism-Leninism, not exactly because of the goals of either, but because he was attracted to extremes, especially to a complete societal change. He believed that Thelema would have been accepted by both sides. Which is not true, Crowley would have been one of the first against the wall. Day two, this is. This is a long video. When the Second World War broke out, Crowley wrote to the Naval Intelligence Division offering his services, but they declined. He was associated with a variety of figures in the British intelligence community at the time, including Dennis Wheatley, Rod Dow, Ian Fleming and Maxwell Knight. And he also claimed to have been behind the V for Victory sign first used by the BBC, but this has never been proven and was most likely a lot of bullshit. In the 1940s, Crowley's asthma worsened and with his German-produced medication becoming a lot harder to get a hold of, he returned to using heroin, once again becoming addicted. And as the Blitz hit London, Crowley relocated to Torquay, where he was briefly hospitalised with his asthma, and he entertained himself with visits to the local chess club. Quickly tiring of the monotony of Torquay, he returned to London, and to aid in the war effort, he wrote a proclamation on the rights of humanity and a poem for the liberation of France because that was going to stop the war. A poem. In April of 1944, Crowley briefly moved to Aston Clinton in Buckinghamshire, where he was visited by the poet Nancy Cunard before relocating to Hastings in Sussex. He took up residence at the Netherwood boarding house, eventually hiring a young man named Kenneth Grant as his secretary, paying him in magical teachings instead of actual wages. You know, like how a lot of YouTubers and Instagrammers pay people in exposure. Crowley was also introduced to John Simmons, who he appointed to be his literary executor. Simmons, however, didn't think much of Crowley, later publishing a lot of negative biographies about him. Corresponding with the illusionist Arnold Crowther, it was through him that Crowley was introduced to Gerald Gardner, the future founder of Gardnerian Wicca. Another visitor that Crowley had was Eliza Marion Butler, who interviewed Crowley for her book, 
the myth of the Magus. Other friends and family were also spending time with him, and among them was Crowley's son, Alistair Ataturk. A lot of people were making sure to visit Crowley, as it was very clear that his health was rapidly deteriorating. On the 1st of December 1947, Crowley passed away and he died from chronic bronchitis aggravated by pleurisy and myocardial degeneration. The man even died of degeneracy. He died as he lived. And despite an entire life of doing every single drug that was available and also being riddled with every STD that was out there, Crowley managed to make it to 72 years old. Crowley's funeral was held at a Brighton crematorium on the 5th of December with only a dozen people in attendance. Louis Wilkinson read excerpts from the Gnostic Mass, the Book of the Law and Hymn to Pan. The funeral generated press controversy and was labelled a black mass by the media. Crowley's body was cremated and his ashes were sent to Carol Germer in the United States, who buried them in his garden in Hampton, New Jersey. Crowley was obviously a very troubled man who made a lot of bad decisions and, let's be blunt, he outright exploited people. But his legacy is still very popular with modern occult enthusiasts to this day, with a lot of modern magic, shall we call it, being influenced by his work. Crowley's religion of Thelema continued to spread for many years after his death, with some Thelemic organisations still existing to this day. And Crowley's work went on to inspire modern-day Wiccanism and Satanism, though not everyone from these groups holds Crowley in high regard. As for Bolskeen House, it has actually become a bit of a legend in Scotland, with many people believing that the place is cursed. Very many years after Crowley owned Bolskeen House, it was actually purchased by Jimmy Page from Led Zeppelin, because he thought it was pretty cool to own Alistair Crowley's infamous demonic house, despite the locals trying to talk him out of it. But Jimmy Page later confirmed that he was too freaked out to continue living there, as he apparently saw apparitions and heard unexplained noises coming from every part of the house. Now, if you want to visit Bolskeen House, you can go and see it. Well, you can go and see its ruins. Bolskeen House seems to have developed a very nasty habit of catching fire. And the place has burned down now about three times, I believe, with investigators not being able to pinpoint the exact cause of the fire. But some legends say that the fires all originated from the room where Crowley would perform his dark rituals. So, what caused the fires? Demons? Ghosts? The vengeful spirit of Crowley himself? Well, none of that, because none of that's fucking real. This man has just shagged his way across the world, man. Fuck's sake. Around the world in 80 gays. It's Count Dankula on YouTube! Everybody subscribe!